So, uh, I've got some of the good, the good gear, the Artline 577. All right, so yeah, I reckon we'll do pretty similar to what we did Friday. I'd just like to work through it. Um, and uh, yeah, interrupt me at any stage if you have any questions about it. Um, and, you know, it might be some of the things we sort of brush over pretty quickly. Uh, but again, I anticipate it taking about an hour and a half. So yeah, this is the 2020 sample exam. So the only difference between this and the 2017, 2018, 2019 is what they went from three hours to two hours. So they're just sort of condensing it down, asking less, but the same, uh, same stuff being assessed. All right, so any questions before we get started? No, so you may have seen some of these questions before. I put them in the exam booklets and so forth. So we'll get straight into it with a vector proof. We've got a rhombus with OPQR. O, P, Q, and R. And we've got this is R and this is Q. And so we've just got two marks to start with. Find O, Q. Okay, so the vector from O to Q, you're going to be going P and then R. So we're going to have P plus R. Alright, the vector from O to Q is O, P plus P, Q going to be P plus R. And you're not getting any marks here for showing working or anything like that. This is just what is the answer. And then the vector from P to R, okay, if we want to go from here to here, it's going to be minus P plus R, or R take away P. Okay, part B, show that OQ dot PR is equal to the modulus of r squared take the modulus of p squared. oq dot pr. So if we have oq dot pr, okay, well vector oq is p plus r, and vector pr is r take p. We'll have distributive law here, so we'll have P dot R, um, take P dot P, plus R dot R, take R dot P. So we have P dot R and take R dot P, they're like terms, we can cancel those. And we're also going to use this property is that. Um, a dot A is equal to the modulus of A squared. So if we have P dot P, that component is going to be the modulus of P squared. That negative is going to stay there. And R dot R is equal to the modulus of R squared. And so that's going to equal the modulus of R squared. Take the modulus of P squared. Which is what they've asked for. Okay, hence prove that the diagonals of the rhombus OPQR are perpendicular, giving reasons. All right, so if this is a rhombus, if OPQR is a rhombus, so that's a square that's been sort of twisted on its side, right? Uh, what does it mean? It means the modulus of OP is equal to the modulus of OR. All right, or, or you can have modulus P equals modulus R. That they're um, they're the same size. All right. So you might say something like, uh, given given uh, OPQR is a rhombus, the modulus of these is the same. Now, if diagonals are perpendicular. Hey man. So if the diagonals are perpendicular, then OQ uh, is if OQ is perpendicular to PR, then OQ dot PR equals zero. Now we've seen OQ dot PR equals um, modulus of R squared take modulus of P squared. Uh, 
but we have as well that the modulus of P equals the modulus of R. So we can say in brackets here, we're just communicating this very clearly. Modulus of R equals modulus of P, and therefore OQ. All right, so that's the first one. Any any issues with that? So we go de vector proof there. Um, the only property we really need to remember there is this one. A dot A is equal to the modulus of A squared. Okay, now we've got a parametric equation. So I've sketched this up here on Desmos in the anticipation of this question. Remember with these parametric equations, right? Okay, this is what I sort of picked up in the test is a couple of people forgot to restrict the value of t or they forgot to give it the domain uh, that it had there. So make sure we're doing that, okay? So I've restricted the value of t there and we get three marks for providing a sketch of that. All right, so that means we're gonna to need to label the axes and, um, and illustrate what's going on there. So I'll give you a couple of, give you a minute to do that one. Show that all points on the curve satisfy this equation. So we've got x to the 4 plus y squared equals 1. So what we know, we've got the equation of this is x of t is cos uh, is the square root of cos t, and y of t is sine of t. And the leap they're getting us to make is this one, right? It's cos squared t plus sine squared t equals 1. Cos squared t plus sine squared t equals 1. And so what that's going to mean for us is if x of t is the square root of cos t, then x squared would be cos t. And so x to the 4 is cos squared t, right? So this component is x to the 4. And y squared is going to be sine squared so we have x to the 4 plus y squared equals 1. So that's the link that they want us to make there. Okay, use implicit differentiation to show that this is true. So we need to find dy on dx. First we're going to find dy on dt. We're going to find dx on dt and then put one on top of the other. So dy on dt is going to be cos of t dx on dt, we need to use the chain rule, alright? We have a function to the power of n, okay? So I might try to communicate that one nice and clearly. We have x of t is cos t to the half, okay? Now we can see it. Function to the power of n, then the derivative is going to be n f of x to the n take 1, multiplied by f dash of x. And the derivative of cos is negative sine. And we'll write that one nice and neatly. That's going to be negative sine t at the top on top of 2 times the square root of cos t at the bottom. Alright, so we, I'll rub that one out now just to make it clearer. So we've got dy on dt, we've got dx on dt, and so therefore dy on dx is going to be uh, dy on dt on dx on dt. So cos of t on top of cos of t on top of, and then you've got um, minus sine t on 2 square root cos t. So this is a cos of t, a on top of, well we've got b there, cos of t on top of 1, and c on d, a on b on c on d, so you can simplify to 2 
star and the love of this. 2 cos t, square root of cos t, the top of sine t. And it's negative, because we have that negative there. Which equals minus 2 x to the 3 on top of y. x is the square root of cos t and the square root of cos t times cos t is x to the 3. Okay? And then find the slope when t equals pi on 6. So we're going to substitute t is pi on 6 into this equation. It's not much use putting it in here because we don't have a um, you know, we don't have any values for t any, anywhere to substitute t. So we're going to use this form of it, and we're going to put pi on 6 into this equation and evaluate it. So when t is pi on 6, I've done it earlier, and I got minus 3.22. All right. The other way you can obtain that is from your calculator, right? Um, you've graphed it, okay, and in your calculator mode, if you've got the derivative turned on, it's going to tell you the slope for any value of t. And so you can just trace along there and obtain the value of the slope when t is pi on 6. Okay, so two ways to do it. Plug it into the derivative equation or use your calculator. Excellent. Move on to the next one. Alright, we've got a complex number question. So stop me at any time. So we've got root 2 plus root 2i. Alright, it says write in whole form. Uh, root 2 plus root 2i. So with this right, um, you can like you're just getting a mark for the answer. So you can do it in your calculator if you want to. Um, there's no requirement to show the working out. Um, maybe I'll just refresh you on how we do it in our calculator. So what we do is we're just gonna write that out. Okay, so square root 2 and then plus square root 2 and we'll put an i after the square root make sure the i is after it and not inside it um, and then what we can do is we can press option complex option complex uh, press the cross arrow and you'll see this one and it's like Convert to R angle theta. Convert to R angle theta. And so if we press that one, um, so that it pops up and we've got answer, convert to R angle theta, we'll get two, it pops out like this, two a quarter pi. All right, so what does that mean? It means two cis pi on four. All right, and so that's how we can obtain the polar form from a Cartesian form and uh, and vice versa, we can go back the other way. Okay. Uh, of course, if we were going to do it manually, we've got the modulus is the square root of 2 squared plus the square root of 2 squared square rooted, so that's where we get the 2 from, and the angle is pi on 4. Of course, that's going to be true because the vertical component and the horizontal component are the same, so this angle has to be 45 degrees, okay, pi on 4. So that's confirming all of that. All right, so that's the first one. Then if we go to the second one, the complex numbers are the same, right? So that's part A. Part B, the complex numbers are the same except it has a negative argument because it has the negative uh, imaginary component. So all that means is it's going to be 2 cis negative pi on 4. And you can obtain that from your calculator as well if you didn't pick that connection up. Okay, now we've got right z equals this in simplest polar form where m and n are integers. So what we've got, I'll write out the, what the question says and then I'll show you the substitution we're going to perform. We've got root 2 plus i root 2 to the power of m at the top and then root 2 take i root 2 to the power of n at the bottom. And so we're going to use, use the polar form here, right? We said that we can use the rules of polar form. Uh, so the first one is 2 cis of pi on 4 power of n, and the one at the bottom here is 2 cis of minus pi on 4, so 
the power of n. Um, and so then when we use the mode race theorem, isn't it? So we're going to, um, it's going to become 2 to the power of n, cis of m pi on 4 at the top, and 2 to the power of n, cis of negative n pi on 4 at the bottom. So this one becomes like let's think about it as two separate components, right? We've got they have the same base, so it's the top power take the bottom power. And here we have cis of theta on cis of phi, so it's cis of theta take phi. Alright? So it's going to be cis of m pi on 4 take negative n pi on 4. Okay, cis of theta on cis of phi is cis of theta take phi. And so Simplest form, 2 to the m take n, cis m, m plus n on 4, pi. Okay. State a positive integer value for m and a positive integer value for n such that z is real. Okay, so this is the complex number z, right? And this is going to be real if it's going to be real, purely real. Like let's think about the uh, argon plane, right? It's purely real if it exists on the x-axis, right? On the real plane. So that means our angle has to be zero or our angle has to be pi. So we have to choose a positive integer value for m and n such that it's purely real. Now I'm going to make the argument we can't choose the same value for m and n. Like we can't just say, for instance, m, um, m and n are both 4. All right? If you were to put in 4 there, we're going to have 4 pi on 4, which is going to be pi, and cis of pi is going to be here, right? So it's going to be real, except you're going to have... Um, uh, no, that, that would be okay. That would be okay because that would just be positive, uh, positive one times negative. That would be fine. All right. So we need, so we need a positive integer value for m and n such that the angle is, um, uh, such that the angle is zero or pi. So it could be any of those, right? So we're going to have as long as m plus n, all right? M plus n has to equal some multiple of four. All right, some multiple of four. All right, so we can put here four k. M plus n has to equal four k. That's the rule. All right, um, where k is an integer, so it could be uh, two and two. It could be three and one. It could be um, uh, it could be five and three. All right, any any um, two numbers that are going to add up such that it's a product of four. So let's go with m equals three and n equals 1. All right, if we do that, then our complex number is going to be 2 to the power of, what's 3 take 1? 2 to the power of 2. We have 4 cis of pi, which is a purely real number. All right, so I'll spend a bit of time explaining that. Uh, and then we just have the opposite. Any value for m and n such that it's purely imaginary. So that's where the angle, if it's purely imaginary, the angle is going to be either pi on 2 or negative pi on 2. All right. Remember when we're thinking of polar form, we go from negative pi to positive pi. So we shouldn't think of that as 3 pi on 2. We should think of it as negative pi on 2. Um, and so if we want to get the angle m plus n, to equal pi on 2, then we need m plus n to equal some multiple of 2. Alright, m plus n to equal some multiple of 2. Um, so uh, 1 and 1 um, could be uh, 3, can't be 3 and 1. So we need, like, if I'm going to set this rule up here, um, all right, so like if we're just going to choose values, okay, we can go m is 1 and n is 1. All right, that's the solution. Okay, you can look at that, that's the solution. 
if we were to discover the rule here, the reason it can't just be a multiple of two is because that would allow this test. It needs to be um, two plus a multiple of four. All right, and that is um, if we have two and then we add another four on, that's gonna give us the six on four. And we add another four on, that's gonna give us the 10 on four. And then we're always ending up at one of these solutions, okay? So that's the rule that it would need to satisfy where k is an integer, but all we're asked for is two numbers, right? So for if this is the case, could be um, m is one, n is one, could be, um, could be if we go n, n is three, all right, then we would have n is, um, n is six, all right, that would be appropriate. n is three, n is six, that would be a solution. Uh, lot, there's lots of values. All right, let's move on anyway. That's a good question. Okay, we have a, a PMI question. Um, should we work our way through it or should we sort of brush over this one? What would you guys like to do? Happy to do this one. Yeah, cool, let's do it. All right, so we'll work our way through it. So we have proved the divisibility one. We've got proved. 2 to the 4 n, so I'm going to make the statement, p of n is 2 to the 4 n, take 3 to the n is divisible by 13 for all positive integers. Okay, that's our, that's our proposition. Now the reason we state it like this is so that when we get down to the bottom, when we're doing our explain step and so forth, we don't need to rewrite the whole uh, statement again we can just refer to p of n. p of n is true, um, assume p of n is true, etc, etc. So that's why we need to state it in our first step. All right, the first thing we do, you might remember state, all right, state, test, assume, prove, explain. Okay, so that's what we're gonna make our way through. So we're gonna test for the lowest positive integer, n is one, all right? So you always test for the first case. Uh, test for n is one, we're gonna have uh, p of one, equals two to the four take three, which is gonna be 16 take three, which is gonna be 13. Thirteen is divisible by 13, therefore P of one is true. Okay, so we've stated it, we've done, performed the test case, we're ready to make an assumption. Assume P of K for some integer K, where K, I need to call them K and A are both integers. Assume P of K, where K is 2 to the 4 K take 3 K, equals 13 A. That is, assume P of K is divisible by 13. Alright, so you get the mark there for making the assumption. And now let's do the proving. So we'll go, we go consider. You can make something like this, or now consider consider p of k plus one, which is going to be all right. So trick here, all right, is four k is not four k plus one, but it's four k plus four because that four needs to distribute. All right, so I'll do that in a couple of steps. Two to the four k plus four, and now I'll set it out. Two to the four times two to the four k. All right, so when we, we've got a divisibility one, that's what we want to do. We want to split them up into their um, into those bases. All right, so that now we can perform the substitution. Right. Uh, we're going to substitute that in here. And 2 to the 4k. So what's that? That's 13a. Alright, 
So I, all I've done is I've substituted two to the four K, two to the four K for 13 A plus three to the K. You see, you can move that component over and we'll have two to the four K equals 13 A plus three to the K. So that's the substitution I've performed. And now it's just a matter of uh, processing it and we're there. So two to the four is what, 16? 16 times 13, I'll just leave it as that for now because we will factorize in a moment. Now we've got 16 times three to the K, take three times three to the K. All right, six. So we've got the 13 out the front there and then we can say which is divisible by 13. Therefore, it's blank. Um, so, And the other strength of stating the proposition, right, is that this explains step, you know, it's almost always the same. The only thing that could possibly change here is your third, is that number that goes there, right? If two's the first, um, if two is, if it's true for n is greater than or equal to two, you know, that could change. Um, so there we go. All right, so that's the, that's the PMI. We've got some five marks there. All right, let's flip over to the next part of it. Explain why two, two to the 2020, take three to the 505, is divisible by 13. Explain why this is true. So all we want to do is try and make a link between this and our proposition here. All right, so, and we'll just try to communicate that. So we might say something like from A, 2 to the 4n, take 3 to the n, is divisible by 13. All right, that's what we've got from part A. We've proved that that's true. We can add on to all positive integers. If n equals, and what number would it have to be? 505. If n is 505, then which is divisible by 13. So that's a that's a reasonably straightforward one. Um, there's not, not, not too much complexity that we need to think about there uh, with the length in that one. Very good. Okay. We've got a cone. A cone is formed as grain is poured into a large cylindrical container of fixed radius. The volume of the cone of grain is given by, we've got uh, a third pi h to the three tan squared theta, where h is the height of the cone in meters and theta is in radians, uh, is the angle shown in figure three. Note that v, h and theta are all functions of time. Show that this statement is true. So we're gonna use implicit differentiation um, with regards to t. So if we have v, equals a third pi h to the three tan squared theta. So we're gonna differentiate all of this uh, with regards to t. All right. So on the left hand side, we will have dv on dt. And on the right hand side, 
I'm going to leave this third pi out the front because uh, that's not a variable, but we have h to the 3 tan squared v. So that means we need to use the product rule, right? u times v. So we've got u is h to the 3, and u dash will be 3h squared dh on dt. Alright, that's our implicit differentiation. We'll have v is tan of theta squared. And so v dash will be, we're going to use the chain rule here, n f of x, n take 1, times f dash. What's the derivative of tan? Sec, probably. One on, one on cos squared. <laughs> yeah, so if it's one on cos squared, that's sec squared. Very good. Uh, and almost done, d theta on dt. Right, that's the implicit differentiation. We need that at the end. We've differentiated theta, so we need the d theta on dt. Alright, so maybe we're, now we're ready to start. Say dv on dt is a third pi, and we have u dash v. So we're going to have 3h squared dh on dt tan squared theta plus u v dash. And they've got a certain way they want us to write it. So if we're looking along, we can factorise the h squared. We can factorise the h squared. So we can just write now exactly what they've got. We're going to factorise h squared, and then it's just a matter of rearranging the terms. So we've got a third pi h squared, 3h tan theta, sec squared theta, d theta on dt right. so there we are implicit differentiation so this is a rate of change question right all good, move on to part B. Consider the instant when theta is pi on 6 and the volume is 3 pi cubic metres. Find h at this instance. So we've got, we're going to be using this, we're interested in h, right? Um, so this is part B, we've got the volume is 3 pi. We've got uh, h is what we're trying to find, so we'll leave that as a variable for now. And we've got theta is pi on 6, so it's tan of pi on 6 squared. So if we're rearranging this for h, right, we'll have all right, rearrange that, chuck that in your calculator. Um, you get 27, which means h is 3. And the unit. meters. Okay, then on to the second part. At this instance we've got d theta on dt is pi on 12. Okay, at this instance d theta on dt is pi on 12 radians per second and the height of the cone is decreasing at approximately 1.81 meters per second. Okay, so I think this is where you get a mark, is to recognise here that dh on dt is negative 1.81, because it's decreasing, alright, negative 1.81. And so then all we're doing is we're going to take d theta on dt, we're going to take dh on dt, we've got theta is pi on 6, what else do we have? We have h is 3. And we've got all of the variables to, variables to substitute into here. 
which is a pretty nasty one, isn't it? Like that's, there's a lot that could go wrong there, so we're gonna need to do that very carefully. Um, to process that, we did it earlier. We've got minus 5.66, okay? So we're substituting all these variables into this derivative equation, and we get dv of dt equals minus, three point, minus five, sorry, 0.66, and the unit, meters cubed per second. Time is in seconds, is it? Yes, because um, the rate of change of height is in seconds and the rate of change of angle is in seconds as well. Radians per second, meters per second. We're not told time in the initial question, but it's given to us implicitly a bit later on. Okay, so what are we getting these ones right? Okay, so we've got a product rule, and then we're just performing some substitution there. Um, yeah, put it in slowly, make sure you put it in, and then check the answer. All right, let's move on to question six. This is a good one, a bit of graphing here. So the first part says, show that this is true. So it says, show that one on x take two, take one on x plus three, equals five. All right, so I've said, when you're doing these ones, make sure you show it very clearly. Don't jump any steps and make sure we communicate it. So we're starting with the left-hand side. Start with the side that you can um, combine together. All right, doesn't, doesn't matter if it's on the right. You start with the side that you can combine together. We're going to have 1 on x take 2 take 1 on x plus 3. And that means you have to state it as it is. Right? State it as it is. This is what the left hand side is. And one way we can bring that together is to cross multiply the denominators, right? It becomes x plus 3, take away x take 2 on top of x take 2 times x plus 3, which becomes uh, x, x take x, 3 take minus 2. All right, so this process here, right, this is what you call expressing a, um, expressing a function in terms of partial fractions. Now the process to get from here to here, there is like a mathematical algorithm that you can do to do that, but as far as the SACE expectations go, it's all, they're always going to say, show that and you can see that it's right through the exams right they're always going from there to here um, yeah all right so let's move on to the next part then draw the graph of this function so um, I, I might just sketch them up here quickly and you guys can come back and do this and I might just make a comment about them so all right again you're given the uh, you're given the Cartesian plane, so you're going to restrict your domain over those same same values. So I'm going to have to zoom out a bit here. Here it is, and they want you to um, demonstrate all the features. So definitely, we've got an asymptote at uh, negative three and positive two, and just make note of as well where the approximate local max is there. So you want to make sure that your max on your graph corresponds approximately with that one. Okay, then you get a mark for drawing the absolute value of the function. I'm going to go like this. Okay, and of course, the absolute value function, all that does is make any negative components positive. Okay, and notice how that maximum is now a local minimum, has the same x coordinate, but the y coordinate has just become positive. Okay, and then in the next one, they've got now do the absolute value take the function. So this is quite an interesting one, and I might explain to you guys a bit of what's going on with this one. That's what it looks like. Okay, that's what it looks like. So 
Um, so you can sketch it, but maybe if I just provide a bit of an explanation as to why it's generating that function, how can I explain that? So look at the red and the uh, green functions, right? Okay, let's just consider them for the negative values less than negative three. They exist at the same point. So let's say we're gonna do, do this point, okay? We have the modulus of it, all right? It says the modulus of f of x, take away f of x. So what it means is we've got that y value positive, take away that y value, zero. That y value, take away that y value, zero. So that's why they've got the line y equals zero until you get to that component, right? Okay, uh, not including that point. All right, not including that point. So the way you can illustrate that on your graph is with the hollow surface, right? It's like that, then you have that component, then you have that. Um, the other thing to notice about this is that it's actually doubled the maximum value. And why is that true? Okay, it's because on the first one it's positive, and then we have take away a negative value of y. So what we have is we have the maximum value, uh, sorry, the minimum value on the modulus is 0 0.8. Take away the maximum value on the initial function. Okay, minimum 0.8, take negative 0.8, that's where we get the 1.6. Uh, so anyway, that's sort of an understanding of it, but either way we can get that from looking at the, um, you can graph all that in your calculator anyway, so you can see that. Now I quite like this question here. We've got an integration question. So this follows on directly from what we've just been doing. And we've got... Uh, find the exact area between the graph, the modulus of f of x, take f of x, and the lines x is minus 2 and x is 1. So it wants us to find this area, right, from minus 2 to 1. Um, Alright. So I think this is an appropriate way to think about it. From... The modulus of f of x, okay, <clears throat> over this interval, the modulus of f of x is positive, isn't it? Uh, this is this is the statement we need to we need to make. All right. So remember, let let me just refresh this with, in terms of modulus. If we have a modulus of x, right, it's going to be. Um, uh, let's think about it like this. For f of x is positive, and negative f of x for f of x is negative. Okay, that's the definition of modulus, right? It's going to be positive if the function is positive, and it's going to be negative if the function is less than zero. Now, if we look at the original function, right? The original function, that's this one here. From minus two to positive one, the function is negative, okay? The function is negative. So that means the modulus of f of x has to be negative, all right? So what that means is we're doing the integral from minus two to one. I might write out the, the the proposition first, so we have the modulus of f of x, take them, take f of x, that's what we're performing, and we've said over this interval from minus 2 to 1, that function is negative, therefore, because it's negative, we have to use this substitution, alright, so this is what it becomes, integral from minus 2 to 1 of negative f of x, take f of x. What's that? Minus 2 to 1 of negative 2 f of x. Okay, so all, all that there is just to show you what is the, the mathematics we're performing. That's probably the complex part about this. Okay, and then it's just a um, reasonably straightforward integration. Is everyone okay with that sort of understanding of it? Um, yeah, so we go definition of modulus at the moment. 
this is negative, okay? Um, modulus means we make it positive. So to make a negative positive, you need to put the negative in front of it. Okay, that's all, maybe that's the negative. All right, so let's perform the integral then. So we're doing the integral from minus two to one um, of, we can pull that negative two out the front as well because it's just an integer. And we have the function of x. Now the function of x is this one here, right? But this function, we can't integrate that. And that's why it got us to show that these are the same functions because we can integrate those partial fractions. So let's perform that uh, substitution there. All right. And let's go. Now, minus two, we'll have in square brackets ln modulus x take two, take ln modulus x plus three, and minus two to one. Now, if you want, you can combine them, right? Ln of a take ln of b. Um, it won't necessarily save any time just because we're up to the substitution step anyway. So this minus two can hang out the front. We're gonna have ln of one take two is ln of minus one, but we're doing the modulus of it, so it makes it ln of positive one, but ln of positive one is zero. Nonetheless, I'm gonna write it out. We've got ln of one, all right? I'm gonna sub it in there. Take ln of, and here we're gonna have four, 1 plus 3 is 4. So we have ln of 1 take ln of 4. So that's when we substitute 1 in. And now we're going to substitute minus 2 in. All right, we'll have ln of minus 2 take 2. We'll have ln of minus 4. Modulus of it makes ln of positive 4. And then the minus 2 here is going to make ln of 1 as well. Take ln of 1. So ln of 1 is 0, so that component is going to disappear. And we have minus ln4 take ln4. We've got minus two lots of ln4. Minus two times minus two is positive four ln4. So yeah, that's quite a tricky question. Um, I think this part's fine. And uh, th this is the tricky part. Um, even if you can't get that part though, you will still get marks for performing this kind of integration here and the substitution. Uh, but the trick, yeah, the, to get full marks, we're going to need that whole answer and exactly, it's correct, exactly. All right. So, any questions about that one? Splendid. Let's move on then. We've got question seven use integration by parts to find the integral of x e to 2x. The last time we were doing an integration by parts question, I was I was doing it around a different way. I do think it is easy to use um, the process that we, we did initially, which is integral of uv dash is equal to uv to take the integral of u dash v. Okay, so that's the integration by parts formula. And so you want to make sure that u dash v is something that you can hopefully integrate. So we're going to just write them out, u, u dash, v, v dash. All right. And I'm going to set it up like this, I reckon. u, u dash, v dash is going to be e to the 2x, which makes v 1 on 2 e to the 2x, right? The integral of e to the 2x, 1 on 2 e to the 2x. So remember, this is u, v dash. Right, so that's where we're getting those components from. And then we can figure out what are those ones. Because now my u dash v is just going to be some function of e, which I can integrate. I can integrate that, so I've got it in the correct order. All right, so let's ma make a statement for it. Integral of x e to the 2x is going to be uv x times half e to the 2x. take away the integral of e to the 2x. Uh, hang on, that should have a half there, shouldn't it? u dash v, and so when I integrate that, that's 1 on 4.
All right, so we're getting three marks there. Okay, so I might rub this board out just for space with this one. So we've got now using integration by parts x squared e to the 2x. Um, so u d dash v and v dash again. And if we go here, if we go x squared and 2x again, right, and v dash being e to the 2x, you will get half e to the 2x. You'll notice that our u dash v is going to be x e to the 2x, so we're going to use what we did over here. Alright, so it does follow on. So let's combine those parts together. So the integral of x squared e to the 2x will be u v take the integral of u dash v so what's that? x e to the 2x Okay, and we know the integral of x e to the 2x is this part here. That's what they wanted us to show, isn't it? Alright, everyone okay with that link between the first one? Very good. Alright, then we've got a graph of x e to the x from x is greater than zero, shown below. Find the exact volume when this function is rotated around the x axis from zero to one. Exact, exact volume. Yep. So, what that means is we're going to be doing the integral from 0 to 1 of pi multiplied by the function squared. So the function is x e to the mi uh, x e to the x squared. Okay, so that's what we're going to process here. Alright, so let's go ahead and do that. Right, so remember, there's sort of method to the madness here. There's reasons why they're getting us to do um, those first, uh, the first integrals. All right, especially because here, like it's saying, you know, find it exactly. I know the leaf we did, uh, we did the integration by parts to find what we're going to need to do for the substitution. So we're going to have here pi. Uh, we've done the integral of that. All right, the integral of x squared e to the 2x is this component here. So let's sub that in straight away. So we're going to have x squared on 2 e to the 2x, take x on 2 e to the 2x, plus a quarter e to the 2x. Uh, we don't need c because it's a definite integral, and we're going from 0 to 1. Alright, keep going. Sub 1 in, we're going to have half e squared, take half e squared, plus a quarter e squared. All right, sub zero in. When we sub zero in, this component is zero, because we have zero times one, so that zero, that zero, and so we'll have a quarter e to the zero, which is a quarter. So look at what's the answer. That, that, Alright. Cool. So that's the 
first booklet. Keep flipping through and get onto the second booklet. All right. We have consider the system of equations shown below. Write as an augmented matrix. So we're just taking the coefficients: one, two, two, four. 2, 1, minus 2, 5, and 3, 2, minus 2, 8. So, yeah, I encourage you, as I encourage myself, to take care. Like, where, where I tend to make errors is just by not copying things properly. Uh, and then, you know, you try and do the row operations and you end up with something ridiculous because you've just missed a negative or something simple like that. It's super annoying. So make sure we're getting it properly. All right, stating all row operations, show that the system has the following solutions. Okay, so it meets, we've got three systems and here we've got the equation of a line. All right, so that means we're gonna get the bottom row to be zeros. Um, so that's so we that's what we should anticipate that we're aiming for. And then we're gonna you know, let z equal t and so forth. So uh, we're gonna get rid of row three, get rid of this element. So we're gonna do three lots of row one, Take away row three. Three take three. We have six take two. And we have six take minus two. And we have twelve take eight. Next, we'll try to get a zero here. So we'll replace row two with three row one, uh, two row one, take row two. Four take one, four take minus two, eight take five. Place row three, we're going to get a zero in this element with four row two take away three row three. So that's what we anticipated, all zeros in the bottom. <coughs> now the other thing as well, with this matrix, right, um, because we're only concerned with the direction, all right, we're not concerned with those numbers as such, if we can simplify it, we should do, like, so another way you could write this row, um, and maybe you would communicate it, is replace row two with a third of row two, all right? So that's an operation that you can perform, not that you need to, okay, I'm just going to make the argument that it's just showing your skill, right, 1, 2, 2, 4, 0, 1, 2, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, all right, so you can do that, doesn't need to be done, you can still solve it quicker. All right, so let's say we've gone ahead and done that, let's let z equal t, so we've got z is t, now we're ready to obtain the solution, we're going to have y plus 2t equals 1, Therefore, y equals 1 take 2t. Okay, so this is confirming what they've told us, isn't it? y equals 1 take 2t. Yes. And we're going to have x. x plus 2y plus 2z equals 4. And we'll substitute in x plus 2 take 4t plus 2z equals 4. x equals 2 plus
Okay, so these, this set of simultaneous equations is describing three planes, right? Consider three planes in space, P1, 2, and 3, defined by the system below. Using the information in part A, double I, okay, so that means we should reflect on what we obtained in part A, part 2. Show that the points A and B are common to all three planes. So what's going on here, right, is we've got sort of three planes, and they're meeting along a common line. Uh, I'm drawing very well. And they're meeting along some common line, okay? So if the points exist on all three planes, there's a couple of ways of doing it. All right, you could substitute the coordinates of A, which is 2, 1, 0, into all three planes, P1, P2, and P3, and show that it satisfies the equation of the plane. You could do that. But for it to exist on all three planes, it must exist on this line, because this line describes where the planes meet. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to substitute that coordinate into the equation of the line. Um, so, for instance, the equation of the line that we've got is we've got, uh, I'm going to just write it up here, x is 2 plus 2t, y is 1, take 2t, and z is t. Okay, so we're going to go, all right, if this coordinate exists on the line, then z equals t is 0, right? z has to be 0. Now, if z is 0, or if t is 0, then y equals 1, take Two times zero, which is one, and x equals two plus two times zero, which is two, which is going to be this coordinate, right? Two, one, zero. We have a consistent solution. When t is zero, this is what the line is. Right. That's confirmed that point A lies on the line. On the line where the three planes meet. And we can do the same for point B. Point B is 0, 3, minus 1. So we're going to go left uh, to Z. Z equals B equals minus 1. Therefore Y equals 1 take 2 times minus 1. And X equals So therefore B lies on the line. Show that P1 and P2 are perpendicular. All right, P1 is going to be perpendicular to P2 if the dot product of the direction of P1 um, and P2 is zero. All right, so if their normals are perpendicular, then the planes are perpendicular. So that's, we're going to have the vector one, two, two, dot the vector 2, 1, minus 2. And then we get 2 plus 2 take 4 equals 0, therefore P1 take equals 2. Figure 8 shows point C on plane 3 and point D on plane 1. And the line through C and D intersects plane 2 at the point E. Find the equation of the line. Okay, so find the equation of the line from C to D or from D to C. All right. So for a line, we need the direction vector, right? We need the direction from C to D. So in order to obtain the vector CD, we do the coordinates of D take the coordinates of C. So we have 12 take 0, we have minus 4 take 6, and we have 0 take 2. So that's the direction of it. So therefore the line has equation. Well it passes through, we can use either coordinate. Let's use C, 0, 6, 2. So that's its coordinate plus some parameter. Now we should probably use a different parameter because we've already used t. So let's go with lambda and then the direction vector 12 minus 10 minus 2. Okay, find the coordinates of E. 
Right, well, E occurs when this line meets plane 2. When this line meets plane 2. So plane 2 has the equation 2x plus y take 2z equals 5. That's plane 2, right? Plane 2 has this equation. And so therefore, the line is going to meet the plane when the line satisfies the equation of the plane. So that is 2 times 0 plus 12 lambda plus 1 times 6 take 10 lambda take 2 times 2 take 2 lambda equals 5. Alright, so I'm subbing the x, y and z coordinates of the line into the equation of the plane. Let's go ahead and process this. 24 lambda plus 6 take 10. That should be a lambda. And take 4 plus 4 lambda equals 5. Alright, so what have we got? We've got 14, we've got 18 lambda. And then over here we're going to have 5, 9, take 6, 3. So we've got lambda is a third. And when lambda is a third, the line is... Lambda is a third, the line... Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When lambda is a third, we'll have um, 1 sixth of 12, which is going to be 2. We'll have 6 plus uh, negative 10 on top of 6. So when you get to this, right, you can, if you wanted to, you could do the operation manually. All right? But I think it probably makes a bit more sense to do it in your calculator. So we're going to have 6 plus, we've got uh, 1 on 6 times minus 10. All right? So just to make sure we're not making any silly fraction errors, we're going to have 6 plus 1 on 6 times uh, minus 10, right? Oops. Alright, 13 on 3. And here, we're going to have 2 plus, or 2 take, and 2 take a third. Put that 5 on 3. Alright, some of them you can do pretty easily, but something like that. Just make sure we get it right. Uh, so that means the what there, you know, we've stated what the line is, you know, therefore E has these coordinates 2, 13 on 3, and 5 on 3. Alright, so they're the coordinates of E. Find the distance from E1, uh, from E to the plane 1. Distance from E, e to a plane. So, well, does anyone remember the distance formula from a uh, point to a plane? I've got to find it in the textbook. So it's something like this, uh, A, X, 1, yeah, yeah. Uh, alright, let's see if I can get it, Z on top of B, on top of, and that's just A squared plus B squared plus C squared, right? Square root. Square, uh, square root of it? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I can, can we reckon that's right? I can, yeah. Alright, let's check. switch them out. Switch them out. Cool, alright, let's, let's just do that and see what happens. All right, oh, okay, grab a booklet there. Okay, so um, where, all right, A, uh, B, C is the plane, is the plane, and X, Y, Z is the uh, coordinate. All right, so that's what we need to know. So that's the formula that we're gonna use. So let's go ahead and do it. So we're gonna have D is the modulus of plane. Now we're talking about plane from E to plane 1. So we need to flip that. What's the equation of plane 1? I might write it up here so I can refer to it. It is x plus 2y plus 2z equals 4. That's the equation of plane 1. Alright, so then we're going to have 1 times our x coordinate. We're talking about the coordinate E, right? plus B is 2 times our Y coordinate plus 2 times our Z coordinate and then 
plus D. So if we move that over, we're going to have take away 4, and we want the modulus of that. So all that means is X negative, make it positive, and then at the bottom here, we're going to have 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 2 squared. All right, so let's evaluate that. I didn't, I didn't do this one earlier. Plus 26 on 3, plus 10 on 3, so 4. We've got minus 22 on 3 at the top, so 22 on 3. On square root of 5. I reckon there's, there's something a little bit wrong. Just square root 9 at the bottom. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> square root 9. 22 on 9, that sounds much better. 22 on 9. Alright, so the distance from uh, E to P1 is 22 on 9 units. Have you? Uh, just put it in my calculator. 22 on 3. Is that the pr pr first one? On the square root of 9? <laughs> 22 on 3 on 3? Yeah, that's right. Uh, what did I do? What did I go after this one? Is this wrong? It's probably good to make sure it's right, just because it, it should be larger than 1, which it is, so that's okay. Let's, let's leave it for now. Alright, so then let's move yeah. on to D. Alright, in part D. We've got the equations of plane 1 and plane 3 are used to model two hillsides at Niteta River as shown in figure 9. And the free state of plane 1 and plane 3 for us. The river is modelled by the line where the two planes meet. A straight bridge modelled by L1 connects C to D. The point E on the bridge must be at least one unit from P1 and at least one unit from P3. Does the model satisfy the condition? Show your calculations. All right, must be at least one unit. Right, so, so what we established here is the shortest distance from E to P1 is 22 on 9, which is, which is larger than 1. All right, so therefore, E to P1 is satisfied. <coughs> All right, that's one of the conditions, so we're halfway there. But we need to check how about the distance from E to P3. What's E to P3? And so what we'll do is we'll perform the distance formula again. All right, we're going to assess, is E um, far enough away from plane 3? All right, so plane 3 has equation 3. Uh, plus 2y, take 2z, equals 8. That's plane 3. So the distance then will be 3 times 2 plus 2 times 13 plus 3. Take 2 times 8. We like that. So we've got six plus twenty six plus twenty six on three. Ten on three. Take eight. So I've got ten on three on the square root of nine plus eight. And so here it's 10, 10 root 17 and 51, it's 0 0.8. Alright, so this condition is not satisfied, which is less than 1. So therefore, uh, not satisfied. Okay. 
Okay, so we got halfway there. We satisfied the first condition, but not the second one. All right, we've got a complex number question. Solve the equation z to the 3 equals minus 1. Uh, z to the 3 equals positive 1, sorry. z to the 3 equals positive 1. So that's going to be cis of 0. We'll apply the Morgan's theorem. So we're going to have um, cis of 0 plus k2 pi to the power of a third. So k is 0, 1, or 2. Remember, we restrict the argument for a complex number from minus pi to pi, and so we don't leave it as 4 pi on 3 uh, on the unit circle. 4 pi on 3 is here somewhere, so we, we change that to be minus 2 pi on 3. All right, so I've only altered that one to reflect the appropriate domain. Okay, sketch them on the argon plane and label them. Label each solution in an anti-clockwise direction from A1, A2 and A3 where A1 is purely real. Alright, so our first solution is cis of 0, which is this one, right? That's A1. Then we have 2 pi on 3, which is this one, going anti-clockwise. And then this one. All right, explain why A2 lies on the line with equation Z take A1 equals Z take A3. Not just the Z take A1. So explain why the complex number whose modulus is equal to um, the distance from A1 to the complex number, the distance from A3 to the distance from A3. So it's saying why does the complex number lie on this line? That's what it's saying. So that's a graphic representation. So how can we explain that? All right, we can say something like A2, it's equidistant from A1 and A3. So what have I got? A equidistant from A1 and A3. Um, so therefore the complex number Going to exist on the perpendicular bisector, right? Perpendicular bisector to these ones. Which has the same direction as A2. Alright, so that's a pretty tricky one to sort of come up with a, an answer as to why, like any explaining one is going to be a little bit tricky, uh, but something like that's going to be appropriate. Alright, evaluate A1 plus A2 plus A3. So there's a number of ways you can do that, but you can just reason a geometric argument, right? A1 plus A2 plus A3 is going to be 0. You can put this this 0 plus this 2 pi 3 plus this minus 2 pi 3 in your calculator. Anyway, we evaluate it and our answer is going to be 0. Okay, the next part says how about the modulus of A1 plus the modulus of A2 plus the modulus of A3? Well, the modulus of these complex numbers is 1. So we're going to have 1 plus 1 plus 1. So our answer to part 5 is 3. 1 plus 1 plus 1. All right, find the exact value, so this is part six, of the modulus of A2 take A3. Now you could spend a bit of time doing a geometric argument here, right? 
uh, but you can actually just do this in your calculator. So in your calculator, if you do cis of 2 pi on 3, take away cis of minus 2 pi on 3, um, it's going to pop out with a, uh, a complex number and you're just interested in the number at the front of it, right? Um, you can even put the absolute value symbol around it so you can just punch, punch out the size of it too. So how would we do that in our calculator? Let's re refresh that again. So to put in a complex number in terms of cis, we're going to have one angle 2 pi on 3. All right, and the angle button is uh, where it says x sigma t. So you just press shift x. So we're going to do that, take away one angle and we'll have minus 2 pi on 3. And we're interested in the absolute value of it. All right. Anyway, you do all that, you get root 3. All right, so that's probably the fastest way. You could also make a, a, a geometric argument, right? Um, you know, you can sketch them up, draw the triangles, figure out the angles, but it's only worth one mark. So I would just go straight to there in your calculator where you can. All right. So then it gets a little bit more complex. Consider the equation w take 1 to the power of 3 equals 1. Show that the solutions to this equation are 1 plus a, 1, 1 plus a2, and 1 plus a3. So how can we show that? Well, we have w take 1 to the power of 3 equals 1. That's what we're going to solve the solutions for. Let me take one to the power of three equals one. So if we let, let z be w take one, then the equation is z to the three equals one. And we've already obtained the solutions to that, haven't we? We have z equals um, a1, a2, and a3. So therefore, w take one is a1, a2, a3, and therefore W is A1 plus 1, A2 plus 1, and A3 plus 1. So that's the sort of substitution that we're after there. So that's here, 1 plus cis 0, 1 plus cis 2.3, and 1 plus cis negative 2.3. Okay, draw the solutions on the argon diagram. All right, so we have, here's the complex number A1, right? But we're going to add one to it. Okay, so that means we're, we're adding one real value to it. So we're going to shove it across one. It goes here. Um, not pointing in that direction, it's pointing in this direction. So there's A1. All right. And same with A2, all right, it's going to be uh, the same complex number, but it's starting, uh, a good way of thinking of it, it that sets the logic, that's where it's beginning from, A2 and A3. All right, so they've been sketched. Flip the page over. Show that the real part, show that W2 and W3 lie on the line with the real component being equal to half. So what we're interested in then is what is the real component of W2 and what is the real component of W3? The real component. Alright? So if we think about W2, it's the equation of the line, um, it's the complex number 1 plus cis of 2 pi on 3. And we just want the real component of it. So I might just make a bit of space here to get that in. So that's what 1 plus um, cos of 2 pi on 3. That's going to be the real component. We're not interested in the imaginary component. And cos of 2 pi on 3, you can look at the unit circle, but cos of 2 pi on 3 is going to be negative half. So we have 1 take a half, we've got a half. All right, so the real component of W2 lies on the line half, with the real component half, and we'll repeat the same for W3.
uh, the real part of double equation is 1 plus cis of minus 2 times the 1 plus cos of minus 2 mm -hmm. times the All right. So there's, there's show that, and that's, that would, that's where it's going. Okay. Evaluate the modulus of W1 plus the modulus of W2 plus the modulus of W3. Again, this is when you can refer to your calculator. It's one we can make a geometric argument. Um, I'm going to make a geometric argument, right? So the modulus of A uh, W1, all right, it's not 1, but rather it's 2 because we've got 1 there and 1 there. And so what's its modulus? But the distance from the point of origin. That has a, a modulus of 2, all right? The modulus of W2 is going to be this distance here, which is 1. And the modulus of W3 is this distance here, which is 1. So we have 2 plus 1 plus 1. So the answer to part 4 is 4. All right. Check that on your calculator. All right. How about the exact value of W1 take W2 plus W2 take W3 plus W3 take W1? Um, so, here, they're looking for the final answer only. One we can do in our calculator, but maybe I can explain a, um, a bit of a geometric argument. So, what we saw in part, uh, what was this part? Part four. Right, we had the angle between, the, we had the distance between A2 and A3. So, let's, let's go back to that. All right. What we've done, what we've done in that part is we've got this one and this one, and we found that this distance was root three. All right, so that was complex number A1, A2, and this was complex number A3. All right, so that means the modulus of A3 take A2 is root three. All right, and so in fact, the distance between all these complex numbers is root three, and that's going to be the same regardless of where the locus is. All right, so even in the next context where we have the locus is over here, we have that one, that one, and that one, we're asked for what's that distance plus that distance plus that distance. It's three lots of root three. All right, it's root three plus root three plus root three. So that's a geometric understanding of it. Um, but yeah, that's one that you can put in your calculator. It's just it takes a little bit to write out as well. Very good, okay, last one. All right, so about 10, 10.30 now, so it takes a little bit longer, doesn't it? And the methods one. I'm probably going to do a bit more talking too. All right. Okay, so um, we've got a differential equations one, right? So we're going to draw the slope field, do a bit of integrating. In an experiment, one type of bacterium called alpha was grown in a petri dish, and the rate of change of the area in the petri dish that's covered by alpha bacteria can be modelled by this differential equation, where a is in centimetres squared and t is time in days. At t is zero, the alpha dish, the petri dish was covered by alpha bacteria that was one centimetre squared. On the slope field, draw the solution. So the first point is when x is zero, y is one, and we're going to just draw the curve through that coordinate. The next part, show that. All right, so we'll start with that. So here we're gonna start with the right hand side. So we've got those partial fractions. We've got one on A plus one on 50 take A. All right, and you can probably state what's the right hand side and we'll cross multiply. Same. Uh, equals left hand side. So I said it doesn't matter what side you start with, um, doesn't matter if it's on the right, but we always start with the side where we can combine them. Alright, flip over. We've got use integration to solve the differential equation. Alright, so we've done this one sort of ad infinitum, right? So let's just go through this. 
So what have we got? We're going to have, the, let's make the statement, we've got dA on dt is equal to half, and I'm going to put the A up here, A times 50 take A on top of 50, right? So now that resembles that, right? Uh, except it's the, uh, the inverse. And so we're going to move this component over to this side. So what are we going to have? We're going to have 50 on top of A times 50 take A. Is it 50 that we've got over there? 50 on A times 50 take A, dA on dt equals half. All right. And then we can't integrate that, but there's a reason we've done this, right? So we're going to perform that substitution for the this part of it, this component. All right. And then we're going to integrate both sides with respect to T. So what's that giving us here? It's going to be 1 on A plus 1 on 50 take A integral from dA, which is half integral of half to T. So we'll have ln modulus A to take ln modulus 50 take A. Oops, half T plus C. Bring the LNs together. E to the power of both sides. both sides to form the reciprocal of both sides. Split. Definitely. Definitely. All right. So, um, yeah, so that's a little bit tricky. So, just here where I perform that substitution, with the, the equation is A for area. So, we can use anything else. All right. Let's go for B. All right. So, we have 50 A. There's a lot of A's going on there. B and C. All right. So, we've got the area in terms of B. All right. I'll give you guys a minute to finish scribbling that down. Um, but yeah, these questions pop up a fair bit. So let's make sure we're familiar, comfortable with the um, logistic growth integration process. All right. Um, and then we need to use, sorry, I haven't, I haven't performed the substitution yet. We've got when t is zero and a is half. So therefore, Very good. State the maximum area that's available for bacterial growth. 
So this equation, right, this is an area equation, okay? And there's two ways to obtain it. Firstly, you can graph it and just say, well, what's the highest it can possibly get? And the second way is our understanding of a logistic function is it can never grow higher than the numerator, right? That's the constraint. And so the maximum area is 50 centimetres squared. All right, so that's a logistic function. Okay, when T equals one, a different type of bacteria called beta was accidentally introduced. Beta bacteria grow more quickly than alpha and the area B in the petri dish that was covered by beta bacteria can be modelled by this equation, where D is time in days since beta was introduced. Now, is the first one the T in days as well? Yes. Sure. Excellent. So they're both in time in days, except uh, D is equal to T plus 1, because it happens one day after. Find D and B when the growth rate of bacteria was at its greatest. All right, so this one we can use our graph. We can, like, if you've got your notes book on logistic functions, um, there is a shorthand way for the point of inflection. I can't remember it. But, um, and it's not in your textbook, but I did put it in the notes book. Um, there's something like C on B or something like that. 79E. Anyway, we can obtain this from our graph. Okay, so if that's the function... Is this going to graph the derivative from the derivative? Yep, excellent. And so we're interested in when the growth rate is maximised. So I might just stretch y right out to what's the y, what kind of y values are we talking about? 100. I'm almost there, aren't I? And for x, we won't go that far. Let's just go to 10. All right, so we want to know what's the y value. So the red function, right, I've graphed the derivative function and we want to know when is, the, when is it growing at its fastest rate. And that's when d, d equals 0 0.874. All right, d equals 0 0.874. So that's, the, that's when it's growing at the maximum rate. But we're asked, what is the area of the uh, function? So that means you need to go onto the original function, 874, and you're going to say, it's a bit difficult to see uh, the original function, that's a bit difficult to see because of my B window, but you're interested in that Y value, which is 25. So when, uh, after 0 0.874 days, the area is 25 centimetres squared. Find the area of the petri dish covered by alpha bacteria when the rate of growth of beta bacteria is at its greatest. All right, so there's a little trick here because there's a temptation to go, what is A of 0 0.874? All right, but the, the trick is, you need to read it carefully, bacteria B happens one day after. So that means we need to go 1 plus or 1 point. It's going to be 1.874. So just 1 day and 0.874 days. So if we do that, we're interested in the first function. I haven't solved either of these, so I'm going to have to sketch it. And 50 on top of 1 plus 49e to the minus. All right, so that's it there, and we want to know when x equals 1.874, we've got an area of 2.475. So it grows a fair bit slower, right? Okay. So therefore, when the petri dish is completely covered, which bacteria is likely to cover more? bacteria B. All right, because this is occurring at the same time, you know, so 1.8 days after they've put the initial bacteria in, bacteria B has already taken up half the dish and it grows faster. So bacteria B, we're just looking for an answer there and that's it.
Excellent. So that's like what we've got 10 minutes slower. Thank you. Then the method.